The title of this lecture is Edema in Nephrotic Syndrome and as you all know edema in, is part and parcel as, and is one of the essential clinical features of uh, children with nephrotic syndrome and during the course of this lecture uh, we will be dealing with the problems of edema. Uh, I will be moving on to the pathophysiology of edema uh, in nephrotic syndrome thereafter uh, and uh, we'll finally be uh, ending with the features of edema and how to manage edema uh, pertaining to nephrotic syndrome. So what are the problems with edema? Now edema makes children susceptible to infection. Why is this? Firstly the edema fluid is a good culture medium uh, so you get bacterial organisms growing if you have ascites uh, there can be translocation of gut bacteria and this, this can lead to peritonitis. Uh, if there's edema in the limbs, uh, this can one firstly compromise the blood flow and also uh, lead to infections like peritonitis. Uh, when there is proteinuria uh, in nephrotic syndrome, you, you get loss of immun in immun immunoglobulins in uh, the in the uh, in, in with with the proteinuria, and this also uh, makes children susceptible to infection. So the edematous child is very very susceptible to infection. So because of that, edema needs to be corrected. Also, edematous children are immobile because they they, they can have they have very very significant limb edema. They can have genital edema, and that makes their mobility or mobilization difficult and immobility as you all know is a risk factor for thrombosis because these patients are anyway prone to thrombosis due to loss of uh, uh, antithrombotic factors and hemoconcentration so uh, edema through its uh, through uh, its causation of immobility or its through the fact that it leads to immobility it may puts the puts the dematis nephrotic at risk of thrombosis as well Gut edema, just like in 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 the edematous nephrotic, just in the same way that you get uh, edema in the rest of the body, there can also be gut edema, and gut edema can lead to can can lead to uh, some some amount of malabsorption, and when uh, your medication is not absorbed properly, uh, properly uh, attainment of remission also is delayed, putting the, the patient more at risk of infections and thrombosis and delaying uh, resolution of the of the of the relapse. When you have significant edema and it it has led to uh, res uh, it has led to pleural effusions, your respiratory uh, uh, functions can be compromised, uh, and this also can be uh, can be quite distressing and put the patient at risk as well. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, scrotal edema and labial edema, for that matter, can be very very discomforting, and uh, uh, it can uh, lead to a significant amount of morbidity as well. So edema, uh, on the whole has a whole host of inherent problems. So this is why edema in nephrotic syndrome needs to be corrected. So let's just touch on the pathophysiology of edema. Now, uh, why are nephrotics edematous? Now, there, there, there is, as you all know, there is massive protein urea, urea in the nephrotic syndrome, and this leads to uh, hyperproteinemia, uh, with and hyperproteinemia leads to loss of plasma oncotic pressure uh, and this in turn leads to uh, fluid leaking out of the intravascular compartment into uh, the, the inter interstitial uh, compartment and thereby causing edema. So there is loss, so there is proteinuria, hypoalbuminemia, loss of plasma oncotic pressure and leakage of fluid because of that. And this accompanying hypovolemia leads to renin, angiotensin, aldosterone axis or RA axis activation and this in turn leads to avid sodium and water retention. So this is basically the pathophysiology of edema that we all learnt in medical school uh, and that we are all familiar with and this is now known as the underfill hypothesis where hyperproteinemia causes reduced oncotic pressure 
and this leads to edema. So this is the underfill hypothesis and as I said this is what we all learnt in medical school and what we are all familiar with. But what are the problems with the underfill hypothesis? Now some nephrotics as you all would have seen are not significantly edematous even with quite low levels of serum albumin. Uh, and even though they are quite significantly hypoproteinemic, they are not edematous. So if the underfill hypothesis was true, they sh all hypoproteinemic patients should be edematous. And further to this, infusion of albumin, usually infusion of albumin alone, does not lead to a diuresis. You always, you almost always need to add a diuretic like fusamide to cause a diuresis with the albumin. But if the, if, the, uh, uh, if the underfill hypothesis was true in its entirety, infusion of albumin should lead to uh, fluid re-entering the intravascular compartment, expanding the intravascular compartment, improving renal perfusion and causing diuresis. But this is not true and this, this does not happen. So again, uh, this is not in keeping with the underfill hypothesis. Further, mineral corticoid uh, blockade with, uh, 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 with, uh, drugs like spiral, with, with drugs like spironolactone does not produce a significant diuresis. Uh, as I mentioned, in, uh, the under, uh, if the underfill hypothesis was true, there should be avid, uh, there should be uh, RA axis activation and uh, 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 RA axis activation. And if you block the mineral corticoid, uh, 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 the mineral corticoid receptor with drugs like spironolactone, th if there was a significant RA axis activation, there should be a significant diuresis. But this not this does not happen, and we all know that spironolactone is a we very weak diuretic uh, uh, when it's used alone in nephrotic syndrome, and you always need a loop diuretic to cause any significant diuresis. So again, this is also not in keeping with. Uh, with the underfill hypothesis. And uh, another fact is that when uh, nephrotics are attaining remission, the diuretic phase occurs well before your serum albumin has, uh, has risen uh, has or has come back to normal. So you find patients losing their edema going into a diuretic phase and if you do the serum albumin at that time it will still be uh, around, uh, it will still be quite low at 20s, at 20s or 18 or whatever. So even before your serum albumin has picked up, the diuretic phase occurs. This again is not in keeping with and, and cannot be explained by the underfill hypothesis. And uh, studies have shown that renin levels are also not uniformly elevated in nephrotics, in the dematis nephrotic, again going against the underfill hypothesis. Now, because of all these problems, uh, investigations, investigators rather, uh, looked into other possibilities uh, for the causation of edema, and through this was born what is now known as the overfill hypothesis, uh, where in short nephrotics are to be in an overfilled state. So this overfill hypothesis is uh, described like this. Now your proteinuria with, which occurs with nephrotic syndrome uh, le leads to an increase in the urinary proteinases or the proteinases in the, ur in the urine. Plasmin is one of the uh, molecules that has been implicated here and these proteinases in the urine activate the epithelial sodium channel or the ENAC channel uh, in the distal tubule and this leads to avid primary sodium and water retention and edema because of this. So proteinuria which leads to plasmin in the urine molecules like plasmin or proteinases like plasmin in the urine go and activate the epithelial sodium channel in the distal tubule and this leads to avid sodium and water retention. So thus patients with nephrotic syndrome are not underfilled, they are in 
reality overfilled and this is what the overfill hypothesis exp uh, explains in reality neither the overfill hypothesis nor the underfill hypothesis are true in their entirety you get some patients who are very prone to hyperbolemia when they are in relapse uh, you often feel them very very often they have very, they have cool peripheries they have uh, uh, a weak pulse and they need albumin to keep them uh, keep the circulation intact these pa in these patients the underfill hypothesis or the underfill theory uh, predominates but you get other nephrotics who are significantly dematous but they always have a good pulse volume the blood pressure tends to be slightly higher than uh, uh, normal uh, tends to be high, slightly higher than normal and you can in, you can use a lot of diuretics high doses of diuretics diuretics and they do not become hypovolemic now in these patients the overfill hypothesis dominates so none of these theories are uh, sort of true in their entirety that most pa patients have a mixture of both these and in some patients the underfill hypothesis predominates and those patients need more albumin and the threshold to use albumin should be lower whereas other patients they are slightly hypervolemic uh, and you can use diuretics without any problem in them in these patients the overfill hypothesis predominates uh, and so both these theories uh, contribute to um, uh, edema in nephrotics uh, in different uh, in varying in varying uh, uh, to varying extents so what are the features of hypovolemia now it's ex this is an extremely important uh, uh, aspect of in managing patients with nephrotic syndrome you always have to look for features of hypovolemia hypovolemia can be a disaster in the nephrotic because the dematous kidney is very very susceptible to hypervolemia and uh, it is very susceptible to acute tibular necrosis uh, because your renal blood flow is already compromised because uh, the kidney is edematous so there can be uh, in, in hypervolemic patients there can be frank circulatory failure it can be in you can be in frank shock with the uh, uh, with uh, with increased capillary filling time with uh, a very weak pulse or a 3D pulse or an absent pulse with cold peripheries so you can be in frank shock with a low blood pressure as well but before this an earlier feature is where there is a narrow pulse pressure uh, so because of the, hi the hypovolemia there is peripheral vasoconstriction uh, and this peripheral vasoconstriction constriction uh, leads to uh, a slight increase in the systolic blood pressure but a significant increase in the diastolic blood pressure which is determined by the peripheral resistance and the peripheral vasoconstriction constriction increases peripheral resistance and puts your diastolic blood pressure significantly up so a patient whose normal blood pressure is about 100 over 70 can have a blood pressure of about 120 over 100 or 105 like that so that a significant a significant rise of the diastolic blood pressure so that narrow pulse pressure you need to pick it and there can be slight there can be uh, uh, mine uh, can be can be there can be a slight hypertension so don't treat the hypertension if your pulse pressure is narrow in nephrotics there will all obviously be a reduced urine output so any nephrotic with a reduced urine, urine output you need to act on it fast colicky cramping abdominal pain is another very early feature of hypovolemia and you need to pick uh, patients always tell my uh, juniors that if a patient if if a patient uh, with if a nephrotic in relapse rather complains of abdo abdominal pain always exclude hypovolemia and it should be you should think of hypovolemia before anything else and it's hypovolemia until proven otherwise once you've excluded hypovolemia you can deal with the abdominal pain so firstly think of hypovolemia when there's colicky abdominal pain and this colicky abdominal pain is caused by splanchnic uh, vasoconstriction and it it uh, it really occurs where it, the pain sort of worsens uh, 
uh, when the patient tends to consume food. So when they consume food, they will complain of cramping abdominal pain occurring on eating. Uh, and if you do the investigations, you'd, you'd find a raised hematocrit. Uh, and if you do the uh, urinary sodium, the urinary sodium would be low. And if you do calculate the fractional excretion of uh, uh, sodium, that too will be low. So you reduce fractional excretion of sodium with a raised hematocrit are the, are the uh, laboratory features of hypovolemia. So let's just touch on the management of edema. Now, what are the indications for human albumin in nephrotic syndrome? Right. So there are basically three. You can have a nephrotic in frank circulatory failure, a nephrotic in shock. Now, when a nephrotic comes in shock, this shock is due to, if the nephrotic is in shock, this shock is due to hypoalbuminemia with loss of plank due and causing loss of uh, plasma oncotic pressure, uh, uh, which leads to reduced intravascular volume. So these patients you need to manage with albumin. So you don't wait for you don't wait for albumin to come, uh, uh, and you just don't let the patient be till your albumin does come. But you need to manage these patients with 4.5 percent albumin, and this is used as a bolus, as a coli bolus, 4.5 percent albumin. Uh, you can use 10, milli 10 milliliters, uh, uh, 10, m 10 milliliters per kilogram body weight, and you infuse it r rapidly over half an hour to one hour uh, to improve the intravascular compartment. Uh, so you basically uh, treat the shock. You treat you're treating the shock with 4.5 percent albumin in nephrotic syndrome. So that is the patient with frank circulatory failure. Then you can have, you can also have nephrotics who are not in shock, but they have other features of hypervolumia, like a slightly weak pulse volume, slightly, uh, uh, sl slightly cold peripheries. You can have a slightly low, uh, sli uh, you can have a narrow pulse pressure. You can have significantly, significant reduction in your output. So they're not yet in shock, but they are hypervolemic. And if you do not address it uh, at that time, nor if you do not address it. Uh, then and there, they will lead, they will uh, sort of uh, uh, re uh, uh, evolve into shock. So these patients also need uh, uh, need albumin for resuscitation. And here you can use 4.5 percent albumin, uh, 10 ml per kg bolus of 4.5 percent albumin. Uh, and as I well, as I should have mentioned with the, with the shock, you can repeat the 4.5 percent albumin till the circulation is established. Uh, and here too, till the circulation is uh, uh, is uh, is uh, all right, or till uh, your peripheries are warm, the pulse volume has improved, you can use uh, uh, re you can repeat the 4.5 percent albumin as 10 ml per kg boluses. And the third use of human albumin in nephrotic syndrome is in the patient with refractory edema, in the grossly edematous patient who's not responding to adequate and uh, to adequate doses of diuretics. His circulation is intact, but if you use diuretics, you've restricted the fluid. So the first thing would be to re use albumin, restrict the fluid, and uh, uh, and. Uh, try to manage the edema uh, 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 with those measures. But if the patient is refractory to fluid restriction as well as uh, 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 the, the use of diuretics, you need to use albumin to get rid of the edema because of the inherent problems associated with edema. So in these patients, you have to use 20% albumin uh, with diuretics from the outset. Right? So 20% albumin you need to use uh, with a lot of caution uh, because you're going to give a, a high, uh, a sm you're going to give uh, albumin which will draw in, uh, the, the, these patients' circulation is intact, so you're going to you're going to expand the circulation uh, and draw in, the, f the albumin will draw in the fluid and uh, uh, you need to send it out with, uh, you need to send it out with diuretics. So you need to give uh, 2.5 to 5 milliliters per kg of 20% albumin and you need to infuse it over a minimum of 4 hours. This is extremely important. Uh, it should be infused very slowly 
and with a, and accompanied with uh, diuretics as well. Uh, so that is the management of refractory edema and you can use only one uh, uh, dose of 20% of 20% albumin 5 ml per kg over a 20 uh, over a, 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 a 24 hour period you can't repeat that even though the patient is edematous right? so these are basically the three indications for human albumin in nephrotic syndrome the frank circulatory failure the patient in frank circulatory failure in frank shock use 4.5% albumin, 10 ml per kg, and repeat until the circulation uh, improves. In the patient with hypervolemia without circulatory failure, there you use again 4.5% albumin, 10 ml per kg boluses, but with caution you can use 20% uh, albumin as well in these patients. Uh, so the choice uh, would, would be according to unit preference. But in patients with refractory edema, they are already overloaded, so you need to give as small a volume as possible. So hence you are going for higher concentration, 20% albumin. You need to give it over 4 hours, 5 ml per kg, only once within any 24 hour period. And you have to use diuretics as well in these patients. And always remember hypoalbuminemia alone or the serum albumin level alone is not an indication to give albumin. Your indication to give albumin is always should always be a clinical decision, not based on the serum albumin. Patients with shock, patients who are hypovolemic without shock, and patients with refractory edema. So it's always a clinical decision and do not treat the serum albumin level. Because uh, certain nephrotics when they've been uh, uh, when they've been relapsing quite frequently, they they readjust their styling forces, and even with very low albumin levels, they do not get edematous and they do not become hypovolemic. So you don't need to use albumin in these patients. Touching on diuretics in nephrotic syndrome now. Diuretics need to if you're using diuretics you need to always exclude hypovolemia i cannot reiterate this more i cannot stress this more you need to exclude hypovolemia using diuretics in the wrong patient can be disastrous and it's if you're not in doubt if you're not sure whether the patient's volume status is intact or not do not use diuretics so always exclude hypovolemia before you use diuretics. But diuretics are the foundation of treatment in uh, of the treatment of edema in nephrotic syndrome. So nephrot diuretics are an essential component in management of nephrotic syndrome. But I cannot reiterate this more. Exclude hypovolemia, and if you're not sure, do not use diuretics. So what are the diuretics we use? We've got fusamide, which is a, a which is a lube diuretic. We've got amiodarone, which is a potassium sparing diuretic, uh, and uh, and and an aldos, aldos, and a mineral corticoid receptor antagonist. We've got metolazone, uh, which is uh, uh, we've got metolazone, which is uh, in the thiazide group, and we've got uh, spironolactone also, which is uh, again a mineral corticoid receptor antagonist. Uh, Spironolactone and amiodarone uh, are potassium sparing, so they, uh, when you use them in uh, conjunction with frusamide, uh, they negate the hypokalemia that the frusamide tends to cause, and they also potentiate uh, the diuresis. But frusamide is usually the diuretic we use, the diuretic of first choice that we use. And remember, because frusamide is carried to the distal convoluted tubule bound to albumin, in hypoalbuminemic states, you need to use higher doses of frusamide in order to uh, get it sufficient, get sufficient amounts to the distal convoluted tubule. So you need, you may need to use much higher doses than are uh, actu uh, that are used that, that are normally used, but always, always exclude hypovolemia. And remember. Fluid restriction is an essential component 
uh, to the management of uh, nephrotic syndrome, uh, to the management of edema in nephrotic syndrome. Uh, so if your patient is becoming edematous before even you start, before you do start diuretics, you need to restrict the fluids and see. And sometimes fluid restriction alone without these diuretics uh, will, will, will suffice to manage your edema. So your restriction of fluid should be 70% of uh, normal maintenance, sometimes even 50% of normal maintenance, uh, just so that you can uh, uh, get, the, get rid of the edema. So fluid restriction is also an essential component in the management of edema. Uh, I'd just like to touch on infections in nephrotic syndrome. Uh, I know the topic was edema, but we'll just touch on infections in nephrotic syndrome. So why are nephrotics prone uh, to, uh, uh, to infections? You get low serum uh, immunoglobulin, you get low serum immunoglobulin levels in nephrotics because immunoglobulins are lost in the urine. They can have, they do have abnormal T cell function, which is part and parcel of the disease. Uh, they can be impaired or alternative uh, complement pathway activity due to uh, uh, complement uh, deficiencies. And corticosteroids and other immunosuppressive drugs, uh, which are, uh, you know, part and parcel of the treatment of nephrotic syndrome, are all immunosuppressants, making the patients more susceptible to infection and we've already dealt with uh, the, the, uh, the uh, we've, we've already dealt with how edema uh, uh, causes an increased susceptibility to infection. Uh, what are the types of infection? We, we tend to asso uh, associate spontaneous bacterial peritonitis caused by streptococcus pneumoniae with nephrotic syndrome. We think that is some, some even think that is the only infection nephrotics are prone to because it's it's synonymous with edema and nephrotic syndrome. So that is it is important, but other infections too uh, are important. And because of the uh, compromised uh, uh, cutaneous perfusion, patients are prone to uh, cellulitis. You can get sepsis, meningitis. UTI, pneumonia, anything. So nephrotics are pr prone to all these infections. So the points to point ponder with regard to infections in nephrotic syndrome are uh, firstly that your steroids may mask the signs of infection. So they may not be, fee even if the patient has significant sepsis or significant peritonitis, there may not be fever. There may not be significant abdominal tenderness when you palpate. So you need to have a higher degree of suspicion uh, uh, when when dealing with nephrotics. So if you have a uh, if you have a nephrotics complaint of abdominal pain, you need to keep peritonitis also in mind uh, and have a higher degree of suspicion uh, because the signs of infection uh, and inflammation rather would be uh, would be masked. We tend to use prophylactic antibiotics in the dematis nephrotics to, to uh, prevent, uh, to, uh, uh, to counter the risk of uh, infection. Uh, we tend to use a BD dose of uh, oral penicillin uh, and this prevents both uh, cutaneous infections uh, as well as spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. And uh, pneumococcal vaccination is also important in nephrotics because of the risk of spontaneous bacterial peritonitis as well as other pneumococcal infections. And another point to remember is that when there is an ongoing infection, attainment of remission will also be delayed because the infection stimulates the immune system and this prevents the patient going into relapse, uh, going into remission rather. So if ever your nephrotic is taking time to go into remission or remission is delayed and your drugs are taking time to act, always look for cult infection. There can be a UTI, you can, there can be an ongoing UTI, there can be another focus of infection, uh, which may not be that obvious because the signs of inflammation uh, are, are masked because of the steroids. So always look for ongoing infection if there is a delay in attainment of remission due to uh, and, and that is and that is causing uh, uh, this delay. So I think we'll end there. Uh, thank you for your patient listening.